Um, so we are celebrating the 17th annual Great Writers, Great Reading series. And um, uh, Mary is going to be speaking um, to us tonight uh, from her most recent book. Uh, let me, let me uh, introduce her um, to you. So um, as you may know, she worked as a copy editor at The New Yorker for more than 30 years. And that experience formed the basis of her first book, Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen, um, which is a, a New York Times bestseller. Then uh, that's followed up uh, two years or four years later with uh, the book that we're looking at tonight that we'll be hearing uh, Mary read tonight, Greek to Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen. Um, Bookless has described this as, quote, the delicious intersection of personal essays, etymology, and travel writing. Norris has written for The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Wall Street Journal, and The Times Literary Supplement. She also created a series of videos for The New Yorker called The Comma Queen. So um, let's start. Um, so uh, I guess I should have shown that first, huh? Um, <laughs> so um, uh, Mary, you're, you're, um, uh, there's a, something I wanted to start with. Um, I know you're going to read to us from chapter six, which is a, a chapter on Aphrodite, um, but it's um, uh, amazing, um, amazing uh, beginning uh, to start in the middle or towards the end. Um, are you uh, are you ready to do that? Would you like to get going? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to everyone who has zoomed in. I thought I'd read this uh, these selections from Chapter Six, which is called "Swimming with Aphrodite," which had its beginnings in an unpublished essay that I wrote shortly after returning from my first trip to Greece when I I, I visited. Cyprus. And one of the kicks of getting a contract to write about, to write a book about Greece, was realizing that I would get to dust off this chapter and edit it into a more focused form for a chapter of the book. Why would anyone want to go to Cyprus? The man asked. He was a friend of a friend and he happened to be a psychiatrist. Because it's the most beautiful place in the world. I answered. Cyprus was the birthplace of Aphrodite, goddess of beauty and love and sex and desire. How could it not be beautiful? And why would anyone not want to see that? The psychiatrist traveled only in August and, pre and preferred guided tours. He had been hot air ballooning in the Sahara. If I had been trying to impress him, I would have washed my feet. I had gotten caught in a downpour the day before and the dye from my shoes had turned my feet purple, but I wasn't. So I jumped into the pool. Of course, Cyprus was a war zone. The Greek and the Turkish Cypriots had been fighting over it since 1963. And what was only the latest skirmish in a long, long history of conflict in a way, that made it more attractive to me. Magnetic, even. Cyprus was the very nexus of war and beauty, conflict and desire. My relationship with beauty had always been fraught. Beauty requires grooming and bathing. Beauty parlors and dry cleaners are named for Aphrodite and for her Roman counterpart, Venus. Her name, by folk etymology, means foam-born. Hesiod describes how she sprang up from the sea when the detached genitals of Uranus, the original sky god, sickled off by Kronos, hit the water sizzling. Cleaning is serious business in Greece, thanks to all those crumbling ruins. Housewives are forever sweeping the floor. The Greek word for broom is skupa. And on islands in the Aegean, the scupa has its own aisle in the supermarket. I had a Greek landlady in Astoria who saw rain as an excuse to take her broom outside and scrub the sidewalk. Through her and the sound of the infernal sweeping, I made the association between brooms and witches. 
In Homer, Calypso, the nymph who keeps Odysseus on her island for seven years, bathes her captive, and one can imagine her blissfully sweeping out her cave, twirling the broom to make patterns on the earthen floor as a prelude to seduction and lovemaking. The traditional birthplace of Aphrodite is the island of Scythera, or Kithera in Greek, off the coast of the Peloponnese. It's not a very big island, and she didn't stick around. Aphrodite needed a bigger stage. She chose Cyprus, or Cyprus chose her. It is a strikingly beautiful island, girdled in blue, with voluptuous rocks and veins of copper. I went there intent on seeing as much as I could in a short time. I wanted to see Roman mosaics in Paphos, the Troodos Mountains, the capital, Lefkosia, a monastery, Stavrovuni, Stavrovuni, where there was a fragment of the True Cross. Cyprus promised also to have vast stretches of dazzling beauty with sun twinkling on the waves and foam frilling toward the shore in choreographed lines of scalp waves. I set my sights on a beauty spot that my guidebook said was by legend the bathing place of the goddess of love. It was near a beach and word was that if you swam out to the rocks at Aphrodite's beach, you would be transformed into a beauty forever. I wanted to baptize myself in the waters of Aphrodite. The Sophrine had come from Venice and was bound for Haifa. I boarded in Rhodes with a deck class ticket after getting off a ferry from Crete. A backpacking elite, beautiful people with deep tans and tiny orange bathing suits, had staked out the sun deck. They had pitched tents and strung up clotheslines and were tossing a frisbee for their dogs. It was as if the Sofrine were their personal chartered vessel. My own style of travel combined the spirit of backpacking with the burden of conventional luggage. I traveled light, but I had no sleeping bag or bottled water. Instead, I had a striped cotton blanket I'd bought in Crete and a flask of whiskey. I found a spot on a slatted bench outside the lounge under an exhaust pipe. I needed to sleep having stayed up all night on the ferry from Crete to Rhodes, flirting with sailors. The captain had invited me onto the bridge which, with its vast array of gauges and gizmos and its unrivaled view of our path through the sea. The chief petty officer, a curly haired young guy, tried to impress me with his worldliness. I have been 46 days in flushing, he said, referring to flushing queens. I had to explain that I was traveling alone, but I put the accent on the wrong syllable. Don't say that, the young officer told me. I had said something unspeakably vulgar, which you'll have to read the book to find out. In the port of Limassol on the Greek Cyprus coast, I rented the only car they had left, or so I was told, a yellow Fiat 500 Mini and headed for Paphos, 50 miles west. They drive on the left in Cyprus, a legacy of the British. The signs were in Greek and English, sometimes in Turkish, and near the port in German, French, and Hebrew. Distances were measured in miles, not kilometers. Gasoline was sold in liters, not gallons. I came of age crossing Pennsylvania on I-80 at 70 miles an hour, so I calculated that I could make it from Limassol to Paphos in less than an hour. I stopped at ancient Kurion, which had a sanctuary to Apollo and a theater built on a slope with a jaw-dropping view. I had the sensation walking on what was left of the temple walls, low stone dividers between long gone rooms, that instead of the ruins evoking history, I was a ghost haunting the past. When I got back on the road, the sun was starting to set and I worried about finding my way to Paphos in the dark. I wasn't sure the headlights were working, so I pulled off the road to check. The road hugged the sea, and what I saw when I turned to get out of the car made me forget about checking the headlights. White rocks studded the water, extending the land out into the sea, which was a deep, pure blue. And the road behind me curved along the shore, a black ribbon threaded between low green hills. Even the freshly painted white 
white stripe down its middle looked like an adornment. All was still and silent. The place spangled, every element expressing its essence in shape and color, natural beauty, meticulously groomed. The place was called Petra to Romeo, and it was the celebrated birthplace of Cyprian Aphrodite. The headlights were indeed not working, but I was so enchanted that I could, I could not be too dismayed. Strangers escorted me to Paphos, and that night in a restaurant, I met two Greek men, one of whom was a mechanic. They spoke to me as in Greek as to a four-year-old and offered to help. So the next morning, after visiting the, the mosaics in the, the town of Paphos, I reported to the garage where my new friends, Andreas and Grigori, were waiting to fix my headlights so I could press on in search of Aphrodite and the baths. First we had Cokes, then we had a shot of Finnish vodka, then we had another shot of Finnish vodka for the other leg, Andreas said. I protested that I shouldn't drink and drive, but I needn't have worried. I would not be back in the driver's seat for hours. Andreas, with his thick black hair and lush mustache, plied me with Greek ever so slowly. He said it was raining in the Troodos, the mountains I would have to pass through to get to Lefkosia. He had never heard of the Baths of Aphrodite. I asked what he was doing that afternoon. I was just curious. Surely he didn't spend every day chatting up tourists in his friend's garage, but he thought I was inviting him to come along. So I had to rescind an invitation that I hadn't consciously extended. I told him no one understood why I was traveling alone. And before I could embark on my high-flown feminist ideals, he said, Ute, neither do I. I did not have the facility in Greek to express this to Andreas, but if I hadn't been traveling alone, we wouldn't have been talking together like this. When you travel alone, you are forced to engage with people. Otherwise, you're stuck with whatever random song was running in your head when you woke up. The theme from Mr. Ed or Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. When you're with someone from home, it's too easy to stay comfortable in your own idiom and daily regimen and character. You never have the feeling of alienation that is so formative to an experience in a strange place. Living in Greek was a relief from my interior monologue. Because my Greek was limited, I concentrated on saying only things that were direct and essential. There was no place for small talk. I didn't have to consider how my decisions would affect anyone else. I could indulge my penchant for detours. I could slow down if I wanted. And every proposition from a man like this one from Andreas and Grigory to skip Aphrodite and go fishing on the sea instead of bathing in it tempted me but there was no reason to let anyone keep me from satisfying my own desires. Life was about my next bed and my next ship and my next city or my next beach. Once in a while, the perfect word would come to me spontaneously and it did so with Andreas in the garage. I told him I was anipomini, impatient. The best known image of the goddess of love is Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which shows her naked on a half shell, arms and hairs curving over her naughty bits, wafted ashore by a personified breeze. Laughter loving Aphrodite was the original surfer girl. There was no danger of my being confused with her. I paddled out toward the rocks, which were farther away than they looked. This was not the place of ferns described in the guidebook. In fact, it was not in the guidebook. It was through the locals that I have heard of this beach and of the legend that if you swim among the rocks, you will be beautiful forever. In fact, it was the man who rented me the car who passed out this myth. I was excited and had to calm myself down to swim the distance. This was not a race after all, but a sensual exercise. What was the rush? I was used to, to being in a hurry, but I discovered that if I didn't panic, I wouldn't run out of breath. The water was warm, the current gentle, no one was watching me. I tried out all my strokes, the dog paddle, the breast stroke, the side stroke, first on one side and then on the other, the two back strokes, the one with the frog kick and arms scooping water from underneath, 
and the one with the flutter kick and arms arcing alternately over the head. I ran through the strokes in a series so that I could enjoy the view in every direction. This stroke, which I invented, is called the panoramic. It should be an Olympic event with the gold medal going to the slowest, most voluptuous swimmer. The water was warm and embracing and the swimming took no effort at all. I sipped at the surface, tasting the salt. I could look back at the beach which, with its low mounds of green beyond the shore and up at the sky, which was clear over the mount, which was cloudy over the mountains, but clear at the zenith. Then I could look out at the glimmer gray sea to the horizon and ahead to the white rocks. They were a peel white like the skin like skin treated at a spa, and close up they were very suggestive. In the biggest one, I made out the figure of a woman with rounded limbs and full breasts leaning out over the water. When I reached her, I realized that the best part of her was submerged, a, a mossy shelf pricked all over with tiny mollusks. I hauled myself onto her lap for a rest. I could not believe it. I had reached the rocks of Aphrodite, and it was as if all Cyprus belonged to me. As long as no one was looking, I was tempted to take off my bathing suit. I had skinny dipped only once before in a pond in New Jersey, and it felt so daring. I half expected any second to hear a bullhorn and have the police roar into the water in an amphibious squad car and fish me out and book me for indecent exposure. To be naked in the elements, it can only be bad if someone disapproves. If a swim around the rocks of Aphrodite was supposed to make me beautiful, the water had to touch all of me. I wouldn't want to make the mistake of silver-footed Thetis, who held her son Achilles by the heel as she dipped him in the river Styx, leaving that one part of him vulnerable. So I stripped there on the rocks and lowered myself back into the sea Every nerve fiber was alive as I hovered in the water. There was no layer of lycra between the sea and me. I clapped the suit between my teeth by its straps and paddled around the rocks like a retriever. I felt as if I had shed a woolen overcoat. The current pushed me gently back to shore and I washed up onto mounds of bleached seaweed as quickly as confetti. I felt reborn. I walked back to the car saturated with beauty. I don't know if anyone would say I was changed, but everything I saw was transformed. It was as if I were drugged. Colors of rocks, flowers, pebbles, grass, thistles, sea, cypresses, and cedars, all were heightened in beauty and somehow graspable, more palpable. After being in the sea, I was returning to my own element, to the land. When I got to the car, I did something I hadn't done in years. Turned the rear view mirror toward me and rearranged my hair. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is it fair, um, Mary, I'm going to ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to our um, all of all of the uh, group to ask questions and we'll take the questions um, through the chat. Okay, so um, so uh, First thing I guess, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to call this book um, your love affair with Greece with language and culture ancient and contemporary, but I think it's also a love affair with language um, and uh, I'm struck by in chapter three, you, you say that good words, good words never die. They keep on growing. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that? Do, what do you mean by good words never die? Well, I came to that conclusion when I was writing about the epithet of Athena. Athena is called gray-eyed in Homer. Glaufkopis is, is the um, Greek. Um, and that word glaucus is supposed to mean, you know, it's been translated as gray and glaufkopis is gray eyed. But as soon as I start looking into that, it turned out it had very slippery meaning. Um, there are as many 
almost as many translations of gray-eyed Athena as there are of the epithet of Odysseus, which is on many turns um, been translated as clever and devious and hundreds of different things. So the more I looked at Glafkos, I looked at the meanings of it in, or the, the word for blue it came up in the Loeb dual language series. There was a footnote saying that it's often translated as gray, but they translate it as brilliant or gleaming, and that if it was a color, it would be blue. And so I looked up how to say blue in modern Greek and asked my teachers how, to, how what the word for blue was. And then I dove into the dictionary, into the English dictionary, Webster's, um, all, of, all of the web three, web two, the desk, uh, you know, the little one, as well as the online one. And glaucus has been used to describe chemicals and different kinds of light. All the words, uh, you know, about for gleaming, the color of wet stones is how one person who has translated Homer described it. And this is what I, what, what occurred to me that um, instead of that word limiting some facet of Athena, that word has grown practically out, you know, not quite out of control, but it's grown to describe so many colors, silvery, golden. Um, so that's what, what I meant about, you know, nobody, there's no place on a form for eye color that says glaucus, mm -hmm. but um, there should be. <laughs> um. That's great. I, I also, this next question is tied to that, and I'm going to share this screen because it's sort of a longish quote uh, from, from Greek to me. Let me see if I can do that easily. So um, here, this is towards the end um, mm -hmm. of the book, and, and you say, I knew a lot of Greek, but I wouldn't say I spoke uh, modern Greek or call myself a classicist either. I was more in love with the language than it was with me. Um, and then I, I just love the simile that follows. So I thought maybe you could talk to us about this. What does it mean to be more in love with a language than it is with you? Well, I guess by that I just meant that I was not that good at the language, <laughs> despite my love of it, especially in um, well, I would say, especially in modern Greek, because when I wrote that passage, that's what I was thinking of, of how often if I tried to say something, it wasn't until the third time that I got all the endings right or the accents and stresses in the right place. But people were very generous and they gave me all those chances. Um, and I had had, I had had a fantasy of actually being Greek. And you know, I couldn't be Greek. I was born in a Irish American Catholic in Cleveland, and that would have been a bit of a metamorphosis to turn myself into a Greek. But what I love, you know, I love everything about the language. I love the alphabet. I love the lore attached to the alphabet that, you know, the Greeks didn't invent the alphabet. That was the Phoenicians, but the Greeks adapted it. They adapted the Phoenician alphabet and gave it vowels. And the vowels are what make the language sing, even though it's written and you don't have the voice of how it sounded when it was first spoken. Um, those, those vowels round it out and give breath to it. And just the idea that there's only, there are only 24 of those letters, but they can be uh, manipulated in infinite ways to have different meanings and to express so many things about um, the lives of humans. And you know, that's what I love about it. And I guess you could say that by extension of any language, that it's flexible and um, valuable because it goes both backward and forward. You know, you're, we, well, in the Greek language, of course, we got so much wonderful literature, all of the tragedies and the epics of Homer, philosophy, and you know, we've been able, to, it's, it's carried that forward to us and, and we can throw things into the future with language as well. So, you know, it's a very exciting thing to me. So is, 
did um, your affinity for, for Greek, you, you um, share in the book um, that it comes from, from, certainly from your own experiences, your life and what wasn't there. You know, what, um, you talk about your first experience of swimming um, and then how you swam, obviously, as we just heard um, when you were uh, uh, on that trip to Greece. Um, would you say that your affinity for the language um, stem from maybe also your daily work at the New Yorker, or uh, I mean, where where does it where where how do you pick how do you pick something to um, study, or maybe something to love? How do you pick such a thing? Well, I think sometimes it picks you. Um, I wanted to be a writer originally, and I wanted to be a writer from the time that I wrote something for first grade, you know, I, or it was a description of my family and I wrote a line about my mother. I wrote that she went to the beauty parlor every Friday for a permanent. And of course, if it's a permanent, you shouldn't have to go every Friday. But my mother was having some kind of treatments that she just called a permanent for our sake. But my mother read that aloud to my father and he laughed. And my father was not a man who laughed easily. So you know, I thought, well, I'm onto something here. If I can write something that will make dad, that will give my father pleasure, then I'm going to keep doing this. And um, it stemmed also from being a big reader, you know, to escape whatever my childhood was like. It was basically a happy childhood, but there's always something, you know, everybody has something that, that possibly that molds them somehow and possibly warps them. Anyway, I was into escapism and I read lots of mysteries and I formed this early desire to write. And when I came to the New Yorker, it was hoping to be a writer. And you know, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to show up and say, I, I could write for you, Mr. Sean. <laughs> so what I did was I got an entry level position at the New Yorker hoping that would help. And I don't know that it did or not, it didn't hurt, but, but if I had tried to live on what I made as a writer, I would be on the street. Um, so this job on the copy desk of the New Yorker, I just had an affinity for the language and I wanted to do that. Um, it was, you know, I thought that I knew grammar, but you come to the New Yorker and you find that you are an infant as far as those things go. And there are people who are so much you know, the language is at, the, at a much higher plane. So I struggled to stay afloat, if you want a swimming metaphor, <laughs> at the New Yorker. And it took a while. For a long time after being on the copy desk, I couldn't read for pleasure anymore. I was always studying, you know, looking for typos and, and often finding them. Um, but that passed after a few years. And I started writing for them, um, talk stories. Uh, and I've forgotten oh, what the question was, but it is true that my uh, that copy editing some of the finest writers in the English language gave me a heightened idea of what made a good sentence. So it was all really very educational and certainly on the level of punctuation. And I just watched what the better copy editors did and figured out why they did it and learned how to do it myself. I, I have a, a technical question. Okay, sorry for the sorry for the you know, the uh, long quote, but I couldn't leave any of this out. Um, this is a, a question about translation and um, and about Plato's Apology of Socrates. Some of the some of the attendees are are our students in the Honors College, and they have they have read Plato's Apology this semester. So I couldn't resist. Um, in chapter three, dead or alive, you. Um, explain uh, uh, about um, you explain how the particles work and how they soften and suggest personality and and um, uh, a kind of a, give this down to earth quality to Socrates right as he's as he's talking mm -hmm. and I thought um, this warmth right you say um, in purple on the screen it says it it is because of the particles in Plato. Um, that uh, Socrates has such a warm presence. Particles give personality to a language. So my question is um, about um, uh, translation. Um, so can, can translators 
capture such undefined traits? I mean, you're you are bilingual, right? Um, can you can you capture these undefined traits, the things that add so much to the reader's understanding? Well, I'm not bilingual. Um, I have to study <laughs> really hard, <laughs> um, but I'm sure that anything I say in English will be full of particles, you know? Okay, give me a break. <laughs> it's the best I can do. And one of the things that I did as a copy editor was notice what I thought of as filler in English, phrases like truth be told, and also you know, actually, really. And these are things that a copy editor would normally look askance at and possibly delete without asking if anybody minded because think, she'd think nobody would miss them. But when I saw how they operated in Greek, the particles mean the same thing. You know, one of the famous ones, you know, is on the one hand and on the other hand, men and that. In Greek, that is all over the place. And in English, it just feels ponderous. It feels like a filler. But we also had, um, um, a rule that you couldn't say on the other hand if you hadn't first said on the one hand. So it got very complicated. And when I thought about how much I took the, excuse me, one minute. I'm on Zoom. Okay, I'm going to bring macaroni. All right, thank you. Macaroni, come in. 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 So sorry, my neighbors here feed me. <laughs> and I didn't have the, I didn't want to hang a sign on the door that said on Zoom. So anyway, that's my neighbor. And she's going to come back with some pasta. Where was I? Um, if I had taken all of those particles out of Socrates, if I had had to copy edit Socrates, if anyone ever had a copy edit Socrates, it, he would lose all that personality and all that juice. You could just see Socrates in, in the Greek, he's saying things like, don't you know, and okay, and well, um, and the translations tend to make these particles sound very stiff. It's just the way on the one hand and on the other hand, sounds kind of stiff in English, but in, in uh, Greek words like mark you, they, they sound archaic. And yet if you make it too casual, if you translate, you know, I'm sure there have been efforts to make Socrates sound like, you know, Jack Kerouac or, or something, um, then, then, then that seems flippant. So you really can't do that either. And the solution is just to thank you. <laughs> My pasta has arrived. You can take those extra plates if you want to. So I don't know what the solution is. It seems to me the solution is to learn Greek so that you can read the stuff in Greek. Right? That sounds reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. And it's not only in Plato. It's also these, these um, articles are very useful in in the dramas, they're all over in the uh, choral odes. And sometimes to get the weight of them, you know, if it had one weight or the other, it would shift the meaning and somebody would seem like uh, he was on the other side. For, for instance, in Antigone, where there's a chorus of old men, you know, you can't figure out, well, who are, whose side are they on? And it could all depend on one of these little particles. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, my um, next question, and I'm going to save time so that our community here can ask questions, but I have a couple more if you don't mind. Um, so you have to do research, right? You have to do data collection to write such a book. Um, and um, I, was wondering, I was wondering how um, you worked with that in the writing process. And I, 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 when I was reading, I kept finding things about um, fragmentation and pieces and remnants. Um, uh, and so here um, uh, from your chapter seven, Acropolis now, um, you uh, write about um, uh, finding, uh, looking at the Acropolis, finding um, 
the Parthenon was in fragments and fragments were scattered all over Europe. And I think that some of, um, some of us, some as researchers feel that way too, right? Um, and you note, I think very importantly that it's fragmentation, the fragmentation of the Parthenon was part of its history. So um, with that as a background, I wonder, no, I, I was wondering if you could tell us how do you, um, how does research work for you? How does data collection work? Um, and how is it part of your process? Well, as you can imagine, there was a lot to research for a book on Greek. I thought there was a lot for a book on English, um, but Greek being you know, thousands of years older and having so much wonderful literature written in it and such a vast range of topics. Um, I could have researched this book for the rest of my life and never written it. And a lot of the research that I did, I, maybe especially with ancient Greek, you know, um, well, and I'm thinking of an example in modern Greek, you know, the poet James Merrill had, had spent some time in Athens as a young man and and written about it and he wrote a poem in fact that that is in the a form of a fragment he wrote the poem and then he took a lot of words off on either side and you just have the this fragment in the middle to uh, figure out what the poem had been about so you know, I got excited about uh, James Merrill and I read this wonderful book he wrote called A, A Different Person, which was about some time he spent in Europe after college. And then that made me want to read a whole biography of James Merrill, it's 700 pages. And then it wanted me, I wanted to read everything that James Merrill wrote. And you know, that's just one example of what I would still be doing. And my research on James Merrill fills half a sentence in the book. <laughs> so everything like that, you know, the Acropolis, how many people have written books about the Parthenon? And I couldn't read all the books about the Parthenon. And, and then what could I, I couldn't put all the stuff I learned into one book about the Parthenon either. So there was a point really at which I panicked. And um, I really, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but I just had to kind of pray to Athena <laughs> that, that I was somebody who was capable of writing this book without losing my mind. Well, I guess I can't say I haven't lost my mind, but what occurred to me in the end was that the title is what saved me. Greek to me, you know, I said, I say very quickly in the book that it's from Shakespeare. And it's not really, I mean, Shakespeare used it, but even that whole ice, ice flows of things flow out of that. Um, this Greek to me has different forms in all different languages. You know, there's, people don't say Greek to me in Spain. They say it's Chinese to me. I think in Greece, they also say it's Chinese to me. So there's a lot more behind the title. But what I was starting to say was that instead of thinking of it as that phrase Greek to me, I thought of it as Greek to me. This book was just going to be about what I knew about Greece. And I had to stop researching and just put together the modern parts of modern Greek I knew, the parts of ancient Greek that I had some special experience of, for instance, having been in those Greek plays. And a lot of it is also about language and you know my, how much I love etymology and the etymology of Greek words and what we have left of them in English. So it was a matter of um, gathering all those things together and making a book out of it. And I had a lot of help. I have a very hands-on editor in Matt Wyland at Morton, who was helpful about what would work and what would not. I mean, this piece that I just read, uh, an abridged version of um, about my trip to Cyprus, it had several more pages after the trip to the baths of Aphrodite that were about visiting the monastery and catching the boat back to Rhodes. And, for the betterment of the book, for the reader's sake, all of that stuff that didn't lead to something had to go. 
-hmm. So I, I still have piles of books that I really want to read. You know, I want to read everything about Socrates and and about the life of Homer, which we don't know much about, but people have tried to guess. And all of the translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad. And I want to have opinions about them, but you know, I can't. <laughs> so um, the, uh, I have three quick questions and then I'm going to turn it over to our crowd here. Um, you write ab about the contagious power of of a Patrick Lee Fermer's writing. And you, you note that it makes people want to follow in his footsteps. And you have this very funny moment where people actually do follow in his footsteps. But um, so my question is, is what other books or writers do you keep on your writing desk? Do, you, do, you, do other writers keep you company? Oh dear, well, yes, for sure. I am in a phase right now where I really like to read books about I like biography right now, and I just read a wonderful biography of Samuel Beckett by Deirdre Bear after having read Deirdre Bear's memoir of being a biographer. I couldn't resist. I had to go on and read this biography of Beckett, which was another 700 page tome. Um, I'm reading now, uh, I could practically reach it right here, the book. Um, Family Lexicon, the translation from uh, the Italian of Natalia Ginsburg by translation by Jenny McPhee, a member <laughs> of Martha's family. Um, and I am, I, I'm eager to get through that because there's another book I want to read after that. Uh, I read very, you know, it's kind of a Catholic selection of books that I read. And especially now I don't have a, a project underway right now, except um, I'm reading some journals and um, notes by a man I worked for named Ed Stringham. They're not published, they're just in notebook form. And, and I'm, I'm thinking that that may be my next project, I don't know. But um, he, he was an unfulfilled sort of writer in that he never got published. So wondering what can be done with that. Well, that was going to be my last question. What is your next project? So um, I really appreciate uh, uh, all that you've shared. And there are a tremendous number of questions. Martha, can uh, you help me manage these yes, questions? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. And please put your questions in chat. And I definitely want to hear from my students. Um, OK, so Linda Sussman asks, how do you deal with the language of Twitter and texting that flies in the face of traditional grammar, spelling, and punctuation? Well, as we know, Twitter and Facebook and those things have made writers out of everyone. And the, the thing about them that separates them from published books is that it's unfiltered language. Um, if you want to turn your tweets into a book, somebody had better edit them for you. <laughs> but the, you know, the strictures of all those social media forms just give birth to lots of abbreviations, lots of um, neologisms, and I'm fine with that. I think it's appropriate for what it is. I'm a little stiff myself in those forms, and you know, I like to spell out the words, and I don't like to leave out vowels. Um, and I am not comfortable with emojis <laughs> and how you have to, you know, one of them isn't good enough. I'm very sparing because I, uh, my style is understatement. And if you want to use an emoji, usually you put five of them, right? You know, and I can't bring myself to do that. It feels like something I would have done when I was 11 years old, but I can't do it now. <laughs> um. Sarah Bow asks, you mentioned earlier how you had trouble reading for pleasure after working on the copy desk for a time. Did you need, or do you still need, to turn off your copy editor brain in order to not go mad while reading for enjoyment? Well, something happened while I was on the copy desk and, and I was able to read for enjoyment again. And now, 
you know, now, of course, I have a lot of correspondents online who want to show me typos they've found and usages that they find deplorable. And I'm kind of the grin, I've reached the point where you just grin and bear it. If something, if you're enjoying something you're reading, just, and you come to some kind of a typo or some misuse or something you just don't like. I mean, it, punctuation choices, for instance, I notice, but they don't interfere anymore with my pleasure in what I'm reading. So I would say, and also having been on the other side of it, you know, having written a couple of books now and had people point out flaws, I'm very forgiving. <laughs> I'm also not copy editing for a living anymore. So, so I don't have that stake in it, I guess. So giving, that's my. <laughs> there's a statement from uh, one of our professors, uh, Patricia Pat Navarra, and she says, <laughs> copy editing Socrates would have made him lose his juice. Love this. Pay attention, my WSC um, one student. So <laughs> you're quoting you. Um, but it makes me think, um, it, 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 because there are people from publishing studies and there are you know, students who are paying a lot of attention to grammar and 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 I have a, a father who's a writer and he he hates to get it wrong he, he you know he 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 would be I would imagine um, a difficult one to copy edit um, so what what is that experience you know like if does copy editing quoting you, Socrates would have made him lose his juice. I imagine you've had some experiences with writers that are, um, and then what was your experience like in copy editing? Well, the, basically, the, you know, John McPhee was a pleasure to copy edit because people who want to get it right, um, you know, they, they really want to get it right. And they're careful in the first place and then they're, the best writers are always the most eager to hear your response and to, to make it correct. If, you know, if there's something wrong, they want to know it. And um, another one who was very accepting, who loved being copy edited was John Updike. You know, and he always wanted to know what you thought or if you had some idea for, you know, if, if there was something you, you felt little you had misgivings about he wanted to know what it was and he found a way to fix it if he agreed with you. Um, my own experience of being copy edited, it was interesting because you know, it's the insecure writers who guard their prose very carefully and don't want any, any change. And if there's a fact that's wrong, they, they get mad. <laughs> <laughs> because they liked it the way it was, and sometimes you're ruining their thesis if you say, well, that, that's a little bit wrong. Um, and there's always a way to fix it. There's always a way not just to fix it, but to make it better. So, so I really tried to keep that in mind when I was being copy edited myself and to make sure I wasn't just reacting um, like an insecure person who was guarding my territory and always leave time to consider whether the, the person, who, the copy editor or the fact checker had a point. And they usually did. <laughs> it's just, you know, when you're the copy editor, you have to be careful not to impose your personality or on, on the writer. And, um, and yet, you know, you, you, it's, it's a bit of a tight wire act because you have to stay alert and you know, not take any um, back talk or not worry about, well, they won't like me if I correct this. Um, they won't like you if you miss a typo. <laughs> and in fact, toward the end at the New Yorker, I started getting the feeling that once the book had come out that um, some writers thought I was slipping on the job. I was, I was being too permissive with them because I liked their writing, so. And I, there's always, it was never easy <laughs> on either side. Here's another question from Susanna Abraham. 
You mentioned how fascinating it was that 24 letters of the Greek alphabet can result in a plethora of words and phrases. What's different from 26 alphabet letters in the English language than the 24 letter alphabet in Greek? Why is Greek more fascinating? Um, I think just because it's foreign, you know, and I learned it in, um, in, you know, there's something about learning something at the right time. You ask the right questions when you're learning something in your 30s, as opposed to when you're learning something when you're four years old and you just want to know, why does the hook on the J go that way instead of that way? You know, <laughs> there's no J in the Greek alphabet. Um, the modern alphabet, in fact, in order to keep in order to translate, to transliterate English, has to had to come up with different combinations of consonants to approximate the sounds that we have in English. I think English has, um, well, English has some things Greek does not. The letter W. If you spell the word Washington in Greek, you have to start with three vowels. It's um, Omicron, Ypsilon, Alpha, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you have to sound it out like that. So it's not a matter of which is better or not. It's just all interesting to see how each language does it. Uh, Jody Daram says, asks, as we know, I, Aphrodite is commonly associated with beauty. Would you say she is also a figure for female empowerment? Also, what do you think is the reason behind the prevalence of the Greek language in English, especially in the sciences? Well, what I think about Aphrodite is what I think about all the gods and goddesses, which is that they are all aspects of ourselves. You know, if you think about, um, I was surprised to have a chapter on Aphrodite in my book because um, I think sometimes that beauty is superficial. But, but when you think about the Iliad and, um, and the causes of the war, beauty is certainly not superficial. I mean, it was the, um, it was Paris falling in love with the beautiful Helen and Menelaus wanting her back that caused this whole war and all kinds of people to die. So that was about sex and beauty. Um, I like to think, well, my favorite goddess is Athena, and that's, she's a goddess of war, and of wisdom, and of olives, and of weaving. Um, so she covers a lot of territory. But what I think is that everybody can be kind of accounted for by the combination of these gods that the Greeks came up with. Um, for instance, I, I think of my father who had a strong streak of Hephaestus in him. He was his, his grandfather. One of his grandfathers had been a blacksmith and he was a fireman. And then he also had a streak of Dionysus because he liked to drink. Um, my mother had a strong streak of Aphrodite in her and also of Demeter, who was the sad goddess who lost her daughter and had to figure out how to cope with that, um, you know, and that's the reason we have the seasons. That's how the Greeks saw it was that you know, Persephone went back to Hades in the winter and came, returned in the spring. It's a beautiful, beautiful myth that accounts for a lot of human behavior and nature. So I think in the book, one of the things that's going on is that there's a part of me that you know, I think every woman really wants to be beautiful, even if you do say, ah, that's only superficial. Um, but it's, it's a combination of Demeter, Aphrodite, and Athena that cause conflicts in me and that drive me forward or backward. Now, I knew I was going to forget the second half of that question. <laughs> well, it's also, what do you think uh, is the reason behind the prevalence of the Greek language in English, especially in the science? Oh. Well, it started, I, it probably has gone back a lot further than this, but when there are so many words with Greek roots in English, I'm thinking of a dermatologist, for instance, derma, skin, how logic is, you know, the study of something. And I have a, a 
lot of them in the book. And I used to think that a word like, um, let's see, otorhinolaryngologist, that's ear, nose, rhino, like rhinoceros, and larynx, laryngologist. I thought, well, that that was a Greek word, you know, comes from ear, nose, and throat. And then it suddenly occurred to me that they probably, you know, although they were very sophisticated in ancient Greek, probably they did not have a lot of otorhinolaryngologists with offices in ancient Athens. And that's when I realized that we have put those words together ourselves to describe things and the, that, that are modern and that didn't exist in ancient Greece. And I think the reason that scientists and people who come up with these words turn to Greek is that it's overarching. It's, it's um, not just Latin. I mean, Latin has a, we have a lot of words from Latin too, obviously, but Greek takes in both Latin and, and English and German. It, it's kind of an umbrella over a lot of different languages that not that are um, has a lot of different roots that are not covered only by the Romance languages or the Germanic ones. That's fascinating. So Lizzie Frank asks, what caused the transition from Confessions of the Comma Queen or uh, to Adventures of the Comma Queen? Did you always plan to write a second book? A Greek to me has a very different flow from between you and me. How did your writing process differ between the two? Okay, well, I never, I never wanted to write a book about copy editing. <laughs> Commas I thought were dull. I just couldn't imagine that anyone would be interested. And even once I started writing, you know, the, the first book had its genesis in some blog posts I did for the New Yorker to describe New Yorker style. I didn't think people would be interested, but they were. And so that's how I was able to get a book contract for a book about English usage and copy editing. Um, and then even when I got that book contract, I still, and part of the contract was a second book, an option on a second book of nonfiction. And I, I had put a lot of Greek into the first book, partly because um, while I was working on the book and you know I was under deadline and um, my editor didn't approve of my partying on weekends, much less taking off for vacations in Greece. But I was invited on a press trip to Greece and I had to go. And I should have stayed home writing the book and to assuage my guilt while I was in Greece, I wrote a little every day about the Greek alphabet thinking, well, it was very important to me and it explained a lot about a lot of things in English and I thought I could wedge that into the book. Well, there are a few things about Greek in the book about English, but most of it didn't make it into the book. When it was time to talk about a second book, it was my editor's idea. He said, would you like to write a book about Greek? Oh, would I? When I first started traveling in Greece, I wrote travel essays, and I don't think I published a single one of them. And when I first started studying ancient Greek, I wanted to write about Plato and, and Socrates. You know, I was just, I was new to these things, and it was and I, my response was fresh. And you know, I don't mean to say anything bad about academia, but they didn't seem to want my fresh <laughs> response to Sophocles, to, to Socrates. In order to write about those things, it seemed to me I first had to read everything that anyone else had written about them. And by that time, my response would be far from fresh. So I'd kind of given up the idea of, that I would ever be able to write about Greek. And and then, it, you know, I wouldn't have been able to if I hadn't first written the book about English. The structures are very different, you know, in the, for the book about English, it could be, be divided up into punctuation, grammar, spelling, um, pencils, and um, apostrophes. And um, so that, that had a kind of a structure going for it. I, we just had to get things in the right order. 
the structure of the Greek book was much harder. I couldn't put it in the order of my trips to Greece. You know, chronologic, chron chronology is usually the fallback for a book if you don't know how to structure it, but it wouldn't have worked for that. And so we had to find some way of mixing in my, um, my urges toward Greek, my actual travels and my studies and the gods and all of the things that I love. And frankly, it's a mystery to me that it has worked as well as it has. <laughs> and I can't, um, one of the persons, one of the people who reviewed it early on said the structure was labyrinthine. And I took that as a compliment. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, just quickly, I it, it, did your editor help you with this or was it, you just felt your way. Sometimes writing a novel is like driving in a thick fog at night with your high beams on and you just <laughs> felt your way. Somebody famous said that, not me, but I think it was Russell Banks. Or, <laughs> but, but, but it sounds sort of like you, you were feeling your way here. Or, or, I had a lot of help from my editor on the structure. Um, it's kind of an occupational hazard for a copy editor to focus on detail. <laughs> and I'm very big on details and that's what I said when I um, I, I also like detours you know I can go off and I, you know that's true in life and in books in words and it was my editor who had the idea of alternating between something modern either a trip to Greece or some etymological thing and something ancient it was kind of a hybrid of travel and um, criticism, I guess, or um, studies, you know. So it was he who had the idea of alternating and it was he who knew when I went on too long about something. Um, both the beginning and the end were mine though. <laughs> a lot of twisting around in the middle. How important a great editor is. Yes. Uh, Cecilia Gray asked. Of my children's lip class today, uh, Oops, Grace. Grace, your uh, your. It's recording, so I'll watch it. Uh oh, Grace, turn your mute off, um, or on. I love. <laughs> this is Cecilia Gray. I loved how you said that that you used reading as escapism which is something that I think many people can relate to, myself included. I am wondering what book impacted you the most as a child? Oh dear. Um, you know, I would have had to think about that quite a lot in advance, but I'm gonna go with Grimm's fairy tales. <laughs> I love fairy tales as a child. I remember, you know, those huge books, the red fairy tale book, the green fairy tale book. I used to carry them with me to first grade. And um, I remember, you know, part of me was just really liking to read the books and part of me was trying to impress the nuns, I suppose. But one of them opened the book once she, she was showing this other nun how, how smart I was and she opened the book and pointed to a word and said, do you know that word? I said, no, when I come to a hard word, I just skip over it. <laughs> and this is still my habit. <laughs> Especially when I'm reading in a foreign language, you know, I, I might back up and look at it later. I read a lot of mysteries when I was a kid. I really, it was, it was pure escapism. I graduated into Dickens. I love Dickens. And um, I liked a lot of action and a lot of characters. I tried reading the Russians, you know, Dostoevsky and... Um, they didn't, what, at 14, I just didn't get it. <laughs> it took a little while. Um, Carolyn Miao asks, what would you say is the most fascinating thing you've learned throughout your exploration and study of the Greek alphabet and culture? Wow. Um, I guess what, what always fascinates me is that something that seems like a, a highly personal experience, something that happens to you and you say, well, this has never happened to anyone else before. 
it's in the mythology. There's nothing that happens to anyone that didn't happen to somebody in the Greek world thousands of years ago, and that you can't find some solace in through mythology. So I think yeah, that's it. That um, you know that and that I was also surprised and gratified to learn that Homer, that the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're the Bible of ancient Greece. And, you know, I guess people treated them like that. And as I said, the story of the whole story of the Iliad is the story of war and love. And the gods are always, you know, they don't behave well, but they give a negative example of how we should behave some of the time. And all of the different situations that that the characters in both the Iliad and the Odyssey get into are examples of the ways to handle things that we still get into. You know, it's it's a different, you know, it's in a different form maybe, but we're still coping with the same range of emotions and human experience. Yeah, um, the the questions keep coming in, but um, are, are there? I like this one. Are there any big because it refers to your Grimm's fairy tale? <laughs> and to you know Greek to me, are there any big similarities or differences between fairy tale myths and Greek myths? Well, sure. I mean, it's a different genre, and I think that the I even the call Greek mythology genre is probably pretty stupid. But I know if you're if you're into folklore, there is certainly a difference between mythology and fairy tales, and. Um, you know, I don't know that mythology really offers morals. I, I don't think there's anything in fairy tales more brutal than what happens in mythology. Even you know, Cinderella's stepsisters getting their their toes or their heels cut off. Um, it's just I, maybe there's some something more moralistic in a fairy tale than there is in a myth. I don't I don't really know. I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Um, this, uh, Kevin Boston Hill says Socrates was also a great orator. Can you talk about the relationship between great writing and public speaking? Well, the really interesting thing about Socrates, one of the interesting things is that he didn't write those books, right? Plato wrote the books. So what we have of, of Socrates' speech is reported by Plato. And one of the things that Socrates says in, in the Apology when he's speaking to the people who are trying him for his uh, misdeeds is, look, I don't talk fancy. This is how I speak. So Socrates, I think, spoke from the heart. And um, luckily, Plato, he had a student who was there to record him and to um, set out his speech the best that he could to re, to um, preserve it for us and to teach you know other generations. Um, I don't know you know I'm trying to think now offhand if there are people who just spontaneously orate who who speak well spontaneously, and I my idea right now is that the best speakers are the ones who prepare in advance. She said, struggling to think of something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question from a student that most, stu her, her name is Abigail Ra Ra Razi. Most students, including myself, are used to being forced to write in a conformed and formal manner. What advice do you have for young writers in developing the more creative and descriptive aspect of their writing? How did you find your writing style and what advice do you have for others to find theirs. You have such a clear, distinctive voice, um, which is, you know, necessary to be, you know, a powerful writer. How did you find your voice is what this seems to be. You know, asking. Well, you know, I think, um, thank you very much. And I can't take any credit for it. You know, the, the voice is the voice. What helped was having good, good teachers. I had good teachers from early on, um, seventh grade, my seventh grade spelling teacher, instead of having us learn how to spell a list of words, 
he had us write stories using those words so we spelled them right and we knew their meaning in some kind of a context um, and then in college i went to douglas college at rutgers university and the first english class i took in college my professor was barrett mandel the course was autobiography and we wrote bi autobiographies we read a lot of memoirs and autobiographies which i love one of my favorite kinds of writing and and wrote our own and freshman year in college was kind of early to be writing my autobiography but it was, <laughs> it was um barrett mandel who who told me stick to your guns do you have a Are voice you sure? i'm almost positive professor walker uh, somebody's you guys uh, we're being what do you call it we're being um uh is that when you, you what how do you get rid of that person? <laughs> okay. I forget what they call it, but somebody was smoking something somewhere. <laughs> anyway, I had good teachers. Good teachers. And, you know, and they told me, you know, when you're going overboard. And it's the same with the editor that I have right now. My editor is now, I guess, my best teacher. I don't necessarily l learn how to do it alone, but I have learned how to take correction. Um, so that that annoying whoever was removed. Um, so uh, we still have a, a, lar a, a large audience, but um, I think it's it, we're running over. So I'm going to ask another question. If there's any, you know, really, um, uh, um, you know, other urgent question you would like to ask, please do. Um, let's see. Uh, Abigail Pitt asks. What aspect do you think is most important in trying to convey a story? Is your tone more important, plot, dialect, pathos? Is any one aspect of writing more important than another? Well, I think narrative um, is, you know, the, is the thing that keeps a reader, something that pushes forward. Uh, and that is, you know, storytelling. And you know, not to get bogged down in details, but to learn pacing and you know when to slow it down and when to speed it up. Um, these are hard things to learn, and I think you have to rely often on another reader to do that or an editor. I, I wanted to get back a little to the problem of the person who. Um, doesn't like having to write to a conformed um, style, you know, academic papers. I had a lot of trouble writing academic papers and always tried to make them into personal essays or to write something, you know, my Chaucer paper was a parody of Chaucer and the Chaucer professor had no idea what to do with that, but, um, but, but accepted it. And I would say, try to bring your personal response into something. And don't be afraid the way that I was when I first had the urge to write something about Socrates. Go ahead and do it. Hmm. Good. Uh, what advice would you give to those who are, uh, who are struggling with keeping motivated while writing a book? Also, what was the most helpful <laughs> you learned during your time working on your books? That's sort of a repeat question, the second part of it. So yeah, I, I, this, this struggling to keep motivated is, is, is you know, can yeah. be. Well, you have to keep with your, you have to be able to sustain your first desire to write the book. If it doesn't hold up through the writing of the book, maybe you shouldn't be writing the book. I think people can tell when a writer is just phoning it in, you know, and the writer is just tired and uh, is not really interested. So, you know, if it's not going to be any good, just I would say, don't do it. <laughs> don't punish yourself for not wanting to do it. Write about what you want to write about. Um, sometimes there is, you know, it's, it can be interesting to write about something that wasn't your idea to write about. It can hook into something that actually does interest you. So you should be open to other people's ideas, even to writing exercises, because they can lead to something um, that is purely you. 
ahead. Um, so we're, we have two more questions. And, the, and the, Jonathan Feinberg has asked this question twice. And I, I sort of felt like it was already answered. But since he's put it back in there, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think he felt satisfied. With the continued prevalence of social media over the past two decades or so, we have seen how language use has changed in certain circumstances. How do you expect language use to change even further in the future? Um, you haven't really asked that. My apologies. You answered that. Well, I don't know that I can predict what will happen in the future. Um, you know, one of the things that I mean, you know, we're not going, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So we're going to be reading a lot online and there are no space restrictions online. So I bet we see things getting a lot longer. <laughs> uh, there'll never be another unabridged Webster's for instance, right? The, there's too many words to be added and the book would be too unwieldy. So maybe things are gonna get longer. I think in time though, you know, the cream rises and the things that are good will last and the things that are um, lazy um, or just put together from other people's thoughts, they will not last. It's original thought and original voices that are going to last. I like writing, the online writing that I read is stuff that could be in a book, stuff that you lean into. I, you know, I, I don't waste my time reading anything that doesn't really grab me. There's too much um, out there. Yeah, right. So, uh, having read Greek works in the original language, this is Isabel Colombo. Would you say that it is more important for a translator to convey the literal meaning of words or to convey as well as he can aesthetic aspects of the text, such as meter and rhyme. Oh, huh. Well, that's, um, that question is at the nub of translation, right? There are the two schools, literal translation and uh, free translation. And I am definitely an adherent of free translation. Um, maybe I should say not too free, but so I, you know, I completely understand any arguments for literal translation. And, um, and I admire people who do it and who are careful about it, but who make something in the language that they're translating into that makes sense. So, you know, really they're rewriting the book so that it's suitable for, you know, making it into English that works the way Italian works for Italians, say. Um, if you're translating verse, that's got to be the hardest thing of all, and that's certainly the hardest thing for, um, so for any ancient work that's in verse. You have to decide whether you're going to try to fit English into a form that was invented for another language or whether you're going to find an equivalent in English of that form so that it is a natural thing for the English language to do. And I think my answer shows clearly that that's what I think you should do. <laughs> find an English equivalent that has the same effect for the English reader or as close as you can get to the effect that the other language has on the Italian reader or the Greek reader. Um. Well, here's here, maybe here's one last question. Um, how do you organize your ideas? A lot of times we have so many ideas and things that we want to talk about. How do you manage all those threads and ultimately decide what to include and what to exclude? This is Nidhi Gandhi. Well, this is what a good editor is for. When I want to write and I'm puzzled about what order things should be in, I just write um, freehand in pencil, you know, I hand write, I just write an essay, I write it all down, everything that I want to say. And if I'm lucky, it's some kind of a narrative that will come out. And then, um, then I, I generally, I type that up, I enter it into the computer. 
exactly as I wrote it down. And it's only when I print that out and I, that's when I start to see what the main ideas of it are and to move blocks around. Um, my editor has often taken a, such a piece, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to send him very raw copy and you know of maybe something, I, maybe there'll be 25 double spaced 25 pages of double space typing and he'll underline one line and say this is good <laughs> but the rest of it is, is hodgepodge and so I have to figure out how to make something lead up to what he saw as good or how to begin with something that's good and make something grow out of it so there's a lot of different ways I'm not an outliner but I do make lists and if something falls into place as, you know, oh, this is going to be a three-parter. <laughs> and it's going to have one movement and a second movement, and then it's going to have a third movement. You know, I should be so lucky as to have that happen. It happens occasionally. It's nice. It's good to have a metaphor for what you're doing. You know, music makes a really good metaphor. In fact, song or, and I don't know a lot about musical forms, but I know that themes reemerge in different forms in different parts of um, musical compositions, and that's also true of prose. It takes a lot of confidence, though, to um, to stand there naked, you know, it, essentially, if you're, like, giving something very raw to yeah. your editor, where there's one sentence that he's pulling or she's pulling out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, you know, the, uh, one of the things I've learned from uh, running this series is you you can have a hundred writers, they're going to each have their own process. And it seems like yours is to get it out on the page and and then work with that raw material, whereas somebody else might go very slowly and, and take a long time to get a draft out. And it's maybe a little further along than yours, but you both end up at the same place. Um, well, with this book, with the Greek book, I really did often feel as if I were rubbing two sticks together to make a fire. You know, I knew there was a lot of material, but it was all chaos. And in fact, chaos is where it all began. So, uh, so in the myths of the Greeks, you have to kind of separate it into, into um, valuable elements and figure out how to fit them together in the best possible way. And I do have, although I, you know, it is, when I need to get something out, it is best to just blurt it all out at once. Then when I go back and start over, I polish the first paragraph about a thousand times, you know, <laughs> and it can take me quite a while to get past the first paragraph. Um, Mitchell Schwartz says, Box Goldberg Variations, um, it fully encompasses what you were saying about music. Best recordings are the Glenn Gould recordings from 55 and 81. Thank you. I will listen. <laughs> this has been so wonderful. Ethna, do you have any parting words? I'm, I'm amazed and I appreciate so much um, uh, what you've shared with us tonight, Mary. Um, can we give her a round of applause? And even if it's just like oh, this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's been fun to talk to you all. Really, really fabulous and um, just great questions. And thank you so much for your generosity and time. We went well over here and we still have a big crowd. So thank oh, oh, that's nice. And I have cats fighting on the porch now. Oh, yes. I have to go out and yell at the cats. <laughs> I'm waiting for you from your neighbor. So right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mary. Well, thank you all. Thanks very much for inviting me, Martha. And thanks for all the technical help. And everybody here is saying thank you, all our guests, as they say goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful evening. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for all those careful questions. And